What is up, everybody? We are back at you with another episode of the League Community Podcast. I'm not even going to bother like asking what number it is. I think we're up about like 16, 17, something. We're just, I've lost track. I've yeah, lost you're really track. bad at it. I'm very bad. Numbers are difficult. I didn't get that part of the Asian gene pool. That wow. <laughs> what? <laughs> Podcast canceled. <laughs> All right. All right my, name is, my name is Andy Belford, a.k.a. Zwill. I'm part of the player relations team here at Riot Games. Uh, joining me today, uh, as you've already heard, is my esteemed co-host, uh, Dylan Most Dirty, Dylan Buckner. Say hi, Dylan. Hello there, ladies and gents. And we've got two awesome guests with us today, two, I would say, longtime rioters. Uh, joining us is Waylon Magus Roselle. Hey, everybody. And Shanti Shantzilla. Is it Shantzilla or Shantzilla? Either Breeze. way, I don't really care. Okay. Shantzilla. <laughs> Shantzilla. <laughs> you yeah. Shantzilla. I heard every permutation of it. Okay. Don't worry about it. I feel like Shant is like a very, it would be very fancy. You Shantzilla. There we go. I'm just. I mean, say. all I ever think of whenever I see Shanti is Sean T from the CrossFit videos. I don't know if does anybody else, somebody out there knows yeah, what I'm yeah, talking about. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah, he's like say. this really intense, like 30 minute workout guy where he's talking to me the whole time. Like, all right, man, now I need you to give me the best that you got and everything like that. So <laughs> that is the speech is, I give to my team my every time I play in league. So. That goes through my head <laughs> that when correlates I see you. Well, yeah, more to the Bob Ross like <laughs> happy little ellipsical, just 30 more minutes. <laughs> We're do some happy little curls. All right, folks, happy little curls, <laughs> little ASMR workout. Fall asleep, it'd be awesome. All right. So, anyways, uh, Waylon, like I said, you've been here for you've been here for quite a while. Almost four right? years. Almost four years. Almost four years. In, yeah. In the video game industry, that's like the equivalent of thirty years, I think. Right. It sometimes feels like it. it <laughs> well, you know, we we have a fast moving uh, job. I would say a fast moving yeah. industry. So, so Waylon, tell us uh, tell us a little bit about your your journey to to Rito Games. Sure. Uh, well, taking it back, I'm a proud Stanford undergrad, studied economics. And <laughs> Sorry, go, I went to USC. Uh, well, you know, not everyone can be so fortunate. Um, I, definitely, <laughs> I definitely didn't get into Stanford after applying, so <laughs> joke's uh, on me. Yeah, I'm a proud grad there. But, I, you know, I did all the, the things that an econ major should do, you know, like I have Asian mom, so I de- <laughs> did, did the eye banking, did uh, some consulting, some finance, and hated all of it, so... So um, uh, the the sort of at that point, one of the primary things I loved uh, about my life was was my hobby, which is gaming. Right, I, I was a, a raid leader in World of Warcraft, and um, decided, hey, could I make my passion my profession? Um, and uh, it, funny enough, there was a a tank in my guild who I recruited, who uh, some of you may know, Jack Eddian, who's now now the current owner of Cloud9, but then was at Curse and. Uh, he sort of recommended me, and that's how I became a product manager at Curse. And, you know, one thing led to another. I played a ton of League of Legends, started in beta, and uh, uh, eventually was lucky enough to get a chance to join Riot and uh, do the whole esports thing. Jack looks like a tank. He, he just yeah. like when you see Jack. So if you have never seen Jack, the owner of Cloud Nine, like he is a tall guy and like he's 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 built a little bit like a brick, you know, what house, you know. Yeah. So I I can see that <laughs> he's a tank. He's so a dependable guy, good guy. Like what you see is what you go, Jack. He's awesome. Was what he a good guy? tank? He was good. He okay. was good. Mm-hmm. He he was he was always like tank two. So like the reliable right. guy yeah, to, yeah. to do all the cleanup. You know. Yeah, the the guy who has to uh, has to pull taunt. Exactly. Right exactly. before the crushing mm-hmm. blow yeah. on brutality. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was that guy. Speaking of which, <laughs> really funny. So as we were doing the prep for the podcast yesterday, May, uh, Waylon and I discovered that we actually were on the same WoW server, on the same faction at the same time, and like probably ran past each other like a million times yep. outside of like Black Temple and Sunwell and all and that stuff. And just in that Iron Forge Bridge. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good old so, Lightbringer. <laughs> yes, Lightbringer. I'm not going to go any further into it because I don't want to like out us like on, a, on any <laughs> guilds of characters or anything, but uh, I'm, I'm actually, you know, uh, to... to, to I don't know tangent a little bit. I'm kind of looking forward to the new new uh, new expansion. So hey, always pulls you back. It does. That's yeah. how it sucks you right always back. Sucks in. you right back in. <laughs> that's, that's how it is. Um, so you've played League though for you said you met you mentioned you played League for a long time. Like yeah. how long actually did you? Did it you it play has League? been since beta. Um, and uh, I, I actually fun fact: Ma- uh, Mark Merrill Trindamir taught me how to play when he came to Curse and showed off League of Legends. At the time, we were a, uh, a Heroes of Nerth. Uh, company, yep. but we quickly quickly turned. I learned Morgana, and I've basically played mid mid ever since. So 
Ari, Lux, Nivea, Oriana, you name it. If I can buy a rabbit on death cap, I'll play it, man. So you, hence the name Magus. Yeah. yeah. Very attracted to that. Yeah. Did you uh did you ever work on like uh any other games like Warhammer Online or anything there at Curse? Because I know I worked with the Curse folks over there. Yeah, we we've worked on a myriad of things, but okay. uh but LOL was was my passion. Eventually nice. uh, you know, when once all once the entire company got into it, built LOL Pro, um and and at that point uh actually got the the curse team initially on board there but uh, then i had the chance to go off and join riot and do awesome awesome esports stuff and and we will get a little bit more into that in just a second so so shanti mm -hmm. you are a man with what i would call a diverse background <laughs> okay <laughs> I mean, where are you going with this man <laughs> i mean seriously like you know going Intrigue. down the list of all of the stuff that you've done like i am right, right. You, uh, you know, uh, Waylon made the joke earlier that you're like, you know, a renaissance man, you know, so and I think it's actually very true not to, to blow your, your head up too much or anything <laughs> like that. But it's it's really like I'm intrigued by this history and I can't wait to hear a little bit more about this. So All right. you started off at the the uh, University of Puget Sound. Is that right? Yeah. One of those little uh, Pacific Northwest uh, wannabe Ivy League schools, you know. <laughs> A lot of those these days. Someone out there is mad loggers. right now. <laughs> <laughs> what was it? Go Lumberjacks? Yeah, loggers. <laughs> loggers, there you I'm go. I'm not quite filled with the school pride that my uh, esteemed <laughs> colleagues here are. I think but that's okay, right? D13 the, the, sports or something, I imagine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the loggers? The loggers, yeah. It's. I mean, you know, it's not the worst mascot it's appropriate. I've ever heard of. Right. Yeah. A lot I mean, of trees up there. I mean, you think it would be in competition with a place like Stanford, right? But that those two mascots <laughs> don't really work out too well. Well, so. I mean, if you look at like, you know, UC Santa Cruz, right? They're the banana slugs or oh, something oh, like yeah. that. I mean, oh, so yeah. so you know, bad it's good. It's so <laughs> bad it's good. Like you, you could do you could do worse. Um so what what did you actually study there at the uh the the good old uh, UPS. UPS, yeah. <laughs> Not the postal uh, the postal company. Right. I actually went into creative writing uh, up there. It was kind of always been a passion of mine and I had a fantastic program with actually some very good professors. So by the time I was ready to graduate, I had already picked out the, the cardboard box I was going to live in, the bridge I was going to live <laughs> under. Right? Like, it's not really a great ecosystem these days for poets. All um, you creative writers out there, you better be taking notes right now. <laughs> <laughs> join honestly, esports. Like it's, it's, it's a, yeah, join esports. <laughs> it's, it was a it was a great time, and I think I I fell in love with it because it very much speaks to people's passion, right? It speaks to how to uh, convince others and tap into their their passions, right? So after that, I uh, I pretty much resigned myself to to a fruitless career as a poet and left for Alaska to work the salmon runs. So <laughs> was that in despair or to fuel your creativity? Definitely despair. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely despair. And to be honest, like it's uh, the 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 fishing industry up there is is a it's an adventure. It's it's miserable. Um, so are we talking like deadliest catch style? Yeah, the same boat. So the the boats that do crab in winter, uh, they go pretty much all year round, and the other major season is the salmon season. Um, gotcha. So D did you ever have like any like near death experiences where you almost got washed overboard? A, a few, a few. Um, I was I was on a barge and and then partly on the dock, but you know it's just, it's, it's up there. You know the we'd hear the grizzly bear alarm and everyone would try to run to the forklifts <laughs> because you know you're invincible in a forklift, right? But there's always there's always more people on the docks than there were forklifts, right? Is that like right? standard so. operating procedure? <laughs> Hide in forklifts? Not running. a whole lot of standing okay. procedures up Wait, there. do you guys like okay. all climb onto a forklift and have it lift you up or something? Or? No, no. It's just like when you're in a forklift, you feel, you feel really safe, all right? Like, sure. Well, yeah. Really I mean, safe. you can intimidate the bear as it stands on its hind legs. You can just be like, lift no, no, the forklift. no. Forklifts are fast, right? Oh. You, drive away <laughs> <from them. laughs> you drive away from them. But are they faster than a bear? Uh, they're pretty fast, yeah. Okay. So, so I never got to test that out, thankfully. But uh, <laughs> it was an adventure. It was great. I, I did it throughout college, actually. So it was a natural, uh, a natural progression out of it. I, I have to ask, what does a grizzly bear alarm sound like? Uh, people being like, there's a bear on the docks. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's a bear. There's lots of yelling. Um, well, I mean, you think about it, like, there's all the fish and everything. You know? There was a lot of fish. salmon. There's so, a hey, lot of salmon, yeah. And, yeah. and oh. turns out grizzly bears love salmon. There Who you go. It's like, Who Yogi Bear, hey, <laughs> <laughs> look at the salmon right here. Oh, huh? it's good. Anyways, that was a horrible Yogi Bear impersonation. So you got you to, like. You kind of dated yourself, too, just a little bit. A little bit, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's okay. 
<laughs> I do that constantly, but that's all right. Um, you gotta like you gotta embellish that a little bit because you're like you're like this this wandering minstrel, right? Going into Alaska, a la Jack London, right? It's your it's your uh, into the wild moment there, right? So mm, I, I suppose know. so. I suppose guess, so. <laughs> did you get any good poetry out of your time in Alaska with the forklifts? Nothing the good. A lot of a lot of like very uh, a lot of very angry poetry, but you know, <laughs> that's, that's a different vibe to it. Honestly, it's uh, a lot of respect for the guys that make a living up there because yeah. you know a, a lot of them go up there for six eight weeks and they they work hundred to hundred twenty hour weeks. It's just there's nothing else to do up there, and you know you're going through hell for those weeks. But a lot of them come back and support their families with sure. it. That's what my that's what my father did. We were able to live around the world very frugally, but because he kind of spent this time in this dangerous place, um, and it was a great Great way to kind of you know have a have a good work ethic beaten into me, which thankfully it was good for esports. It was good for esports <laughs> later, right? Especially in those early days. When yeah, it was, uh, 2012. You know, beaten into you by the ocean, yeah. by the way, right? Yeah. I'm just gonna yes interpret as you will. Yes, okay. <laughs> <as you> will. <laughs> yeah. Um, so like you 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 left Alaska, you escaped the docks, and then you had another interesting stop along the journey of your life. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It was um, it was a field that I had kind of been gravitating towards, um, almost as like a family business. Um, but the the area of cutting edge nuclear technology, um, it was, it was uh, <laughs> something that was very pertinent, kind of growing up, uh, something my father was very involved in. He went from being a fisherman to being like a uh, an expert in this field. And so I kind of had always been around the periphery of that. It's, it's the cutting edge of creative writing, you see. <laughs> not necessarily creative writing. Um, thankfully, not a lot of creativity in that field. <laughs> when talking about nuclear stuff, you don't really want those two mixing. Is your father happen to be Dr. Emmett Brown? He's, he's <laughs> not. Think, he is I not. can just like imagining somebody like making like Mr. Fusion and just throwing fish. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> yeah, I, we haven't figured out how to connect those two worlds yet. Maybe okay. one day. All right. Um, but, you know, I had this this background of, of uh, editing and writing and, and literature, and it turns out there was a lot of work in that field um, for for my particular skill set coming out of that. Not the salmon side, but the writing side. <laughs> and so I kind of had a few years of being able to uh, kind of flourish in this industry and, and help these scientists uh, publish their works, publish their books, um, it was a fantastic experience, um, and I think like so many other stories of riders, um, you know, I was, I, I was feeling successful, I was having a very unique experience, but there was a, a little part of me that wanted to do what I really was passionate about, which was gaming. Um, I'd, I've grown up as a gamer my entire life, whether it's, you know, digital or board games. I played bridge for very many years with my family, you know, it's like, and that's true of many writers, I think, too. Is yeah. Games, not just digital, but the... the, the just gaming. Art general. of gaming, right? Did um, you ever play Euchre? Uh, a little bit. A little bit. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so it's one I always, like, know that, like, that's, like, from... Euchre is a game that is, like, very popular in the Midwest, right? Like, uh, uh, Indiana especially. My wife's entire family plays Euchre. But that's, like, kind of one of those, like, obscure ones that not many people know about. So it's got the worst the name. Yeah, what what yeah. is it? Euchre. It's E-U-C-H-R-E. -E, sure. Right? What's the What's the game? I can't even begin to okay. describe it. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. Uh, yeah. <laughs> All I know is like you want to take – it's kind of like hearts and spades in the sense that you want to take tricks, right? Yeah. And you can choose to shoot sure. the moon – not mm -hmm. shoot the moon, but you can choose to go it alone and stuff like that. Like it, it's similar but different, right? Uh, and you only play with like the nine through the ace, I think, or something. I, dude, it is – it's – it's this. It's, it's terribly uninteresting. You're correct. <laughs> <laughs> so actually, uh, uh, though, talking about games, we actually uh, usually uh, we we usually ask this question of everybody who's on on the podcast, like what uh, Waylon, what was like the the kind of the formative games for you that you really, aside from like World of Warcraft, um, sure, like the ones that like really like spoke to you as a kid. Okay, um, so the first game that I owned, and because I would go and play on my friend's systems, but uh, I remember distinctively getting a Super Nintendo Final Fantasy 4 or 2, depending on uh, if you're <laughs> Japanese or, or the U.S. I care about JRPGs, guys. Um, and so that that game I played so intensely that I would like dream about the game and and that oh, was we've what, all been what, there. Yeah, that's what kicked me <laughs> off into sort of the RPG world. And um, But beyond that, I mean, it was actually... Um, games like online games, online multiplayer games, is what I've all been about. Like Dragon Realms, text based muds on AOL, and then eventually went left AOL. That got me into EverQuest, which got me into WoW, and and so like actually 
prior to League of Legends. I hated PvP games. I was all about story and and like PvE and, and guilds and social stuff. And uh, and then I just wanted to 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 kill fools on the rift. So that yeah. that League of Legends <laughs> has been a, a tangent in my gaming world. Very nice. And Shanti, how about yourself, man? Uh, I think it's got to be Warcraft, Orcs, and Humans. Oh, oh man. Original. That's a solid one. Yeah, yeah it uh, it absolutely blew my mind the first time I played it. Um, I could not imagine trying to play it again these days. Like, I remember you could only select four units at once. That was the maximum yeah. unit size selection. Yeah. Um, but that kind of cascaded into Warcraft 2, II, Warcraft 3, StarCraft Um Total War series, oh, loved God. it. You and Total War. Uh, me oh, and Total War. God. Yeah, I have. I have Guilty a few. Pleasure. I have a week. Uh, I have a week of vacation set up for when Warhammer Total War comes oh, out. I'm so excited, dude. I I cried a little bit when they announced the month delay. Uh, yes, I'm yes, so yes, excited yeah. to play some dwarves. Yeah. Oh man. And the, so sad the vampire that my, counts. Oh, yeah. So many good races, and I, I will say this though. Winding back, uh, one game which I didn't mention, which has actually resurfaced in the esports team that was very impactful on me and i know andy loves it too magic the gathering oh uh, man uh, can't get enough of it learned how to draft two years ago on the esports team and we have just been like heroin addicts <laughs> on, like can't get enough of shadows of innistrad coming out like lots of midnight drafts so oh, yeah. uh, i have to give a shout out to all the magic players out there yeah my, my desk mate just yesterday threw a card at me and just said man these things are like dust mites around here <laughs> yeah. not so many magic cards yeah. we, you, we you might say that we're aficionados of the game oh, yes. sure. so, yeah. oh yeah i'm looking forward to this weekend and pre-release can't wait bit, mm-hmm. so um so it's really awesome, like your background with gaming, the games that were formative to you. But like you said, you've been playing League for a long time. I know Shanti, you're like Diamond, right, or something like that, right? You're, you're I think really so, yeah. Player. I think I, I, I think I'm, I, I think so. I'm plateaued right now at D4. <laughs> uh, so you're like a mediocre Diamond player. I think right? I'm you know, like top. You know, everything's world, relative, man. You know? Everything's relative. <laughs> you know, you talk to you talk to the guys who are on stage and the guys who are you know. Even, you know, we have ex pros that work on the observer team, and so on mm-hmm. and so forth. And like, those guys are in a different galaxy than yeah. I'm competing in, right? Um, the the one of the amazing things about League of Legends is the skill differential between even within a within a league is incredible, right? The mastery is just so so expandable. Yeah, well, and that's that is very true. Like what you're saying, like the the guys and the the folks who are playing the game at the LCS level, they're playing just a completely different game than. Even like the masters tier uh, or yeah, challenger folks, absolutely. like it's it's a very absolutely. different game. And Waylon, how about yourself? Like, are you are you okay, comfortable talking? Yeah, yeah. About I mean, look, I play <laughs> enough ranked to to hit gold, so I can kit my victorious skin, and then yes. I'm I'm back to to normals. Yeah. Uh, I would say, uh, you know, gold, plat, maybe if I made a push. But like, I play only mid, so I'll I'll play when I've got five people and i love i love the team dynamic of the game mm-hmm. so i mean not not just because i only want to play mid but i find that uh, league of legends not only is it a totally different game at each skill level but uh playing sort of whether it's one or two or three in dynamic queue uh or playing as a full fives mm-hmm. i at this point after you know many runs at riot rumble our, our internal tournament uh i really can't play league unless it's a full five now because that to me is like the purest form of league of legends it's a team game you're relying on your teammates you don't always carry them sometimes they carry you it's it's uh that's sort of the most beautiful aspect of the game for me right now it's uh it's definitely something that can bring people very close together and make you want to kill each other oh, <laughs> yeah. uh, i have been I've, I've been working on my rage problem <laughs> <laughs> fives are absolutely me. great yeah. e- even better though are the the in-houses as we call oh, them yeah. here oh, where yeah. where it's five, you know, five of you in an area versus five people. Hopefully, right next to you, so you can like, you know, stand up and yell after you've killed them. That yeah, kind of esports thing. has a healthy multi-year <laughs> rivalry with the finance team. Yeah, so, yeah. well, the, that's the two. The, so the finance team and the esports team are like the two highest rated uh, rated teams of players within Riot. Is that right? Uh, across the different in, in, in gameplay, but but yeah, across the spectrums, we've been successful. And now, can you call it a rivalry if esports wins all if the we time? All win, I don't know. Oh. We're, being, we're being generous. We're being generous. All right. <laughs> no, uh, those guys. Next, are great. Next week we'll have a, a finance podcast for no, no <laughs> Sorry, finance folks. Uh, let's talk actually a little bit about. So before we get into the the subject, the pod, the, the podcast, we're going to talk a little bit about esports here at Riot. But uh, obviously, you work in the esports group, uh, Shanti. What do you do uh, in within the esports group now? Yeah, yeah. Uh, these days, I'm an associate esports manager. I run the Fandom Initiative, which is a, a team that's focused on creating new experiences within the esports space to 
to help uh, fans be fans. I, I thought you say. said phantom at first, and I was like, oh my god. Yeah, it's this? very hush hush. Yeah, <laughs> very. Uh, black um, helicopters. <laughs> yeah. I, I keep putting in a request to buy them, but the finance team keeps turning me down for black <laughs> helicopters. So I don't. You gotta let them win the next rumble. Or yeah, something. I gotta let them win the next rumble. Exactly. <laughs> uh, but I touch a lot of different parts of esports, whether it's recruiting, whether it's um, you know being a product owner for events. Uh, All Star has been my baby the last uh, the last two years, so it's kind of been an awesome process to see that event mature and kind of grow into its own identity. So uh, it's been a wild ride for me in esports. Uh, back from the days that you know Waylon and I, season two. I remember distinctly you coming to me and be like, hey, have you ever written a script before? And I was like, nope. And you're like, all right, well, we have to write the script for the season two world championships. And I was like, okay. <laughs> and by we, I mean you. No, no, we, no, did, no. we did it we together. Did it together. Oh, okay. Um, oh, okay. We would take turns passing out because it was like 3 a.m. <laughs> and we just like, you know, we, we wrote the script every night for the next day. So oh, we the like spent days. the whole day working the event and then wrote the script. And, uh, yeah, th- those were the good old days. Uh, <laughs> Thank God we didn't have to actually yeah. write what they were saying. It was, it was <laughs> like the intro, the outros, et cetera, right? Yeah. Um, but looking back, we were grossly unqualified for that. <laughs> but yeah. no one was really qualified. Yeah, exactly. Well, yeah, you were building it in the air, right? Exactly. Very That's much a phrase so. we like to use around here. So, uh, Waylon, what, what is your role uh, within the esports team here? Sure. Um, at, at this point, I, I co-lead the team with a partner of mine, Jared Kennedy, and uh, I focus on um, sort of the, what we call the product side. So, um, you know, the operation of the league, the the broadcast, the content that we create, um the, the development work that we do. So anything that, that touches players. Um, so the, the, the global holistic esports experience. What would the other side be? You mentioned. Oh, uh, yeah. I'm, my, my partner, Jared, uh, works on esports as a business uh, in terms of like, how do we build a, uh, how, how do we create this, this, this ecosystem that we've created? How do we make it a sustainable, long term generational sport? And, uh, and, and that's a, that's a tough one. He's got a, a a big yeah. challenge ahead of him. Yeah. <laughs> but he's a good guy. He'll do it. I mean, that's a that's a really interesting concept, though. Like, e- not just, like, esports as a generational thing, but, like, League of Legends actually is a generational thing. Like, what are some of the, the challenges we have in, in actually just taking those first steps towards that that goal? I mean, the, the the big thing that we've been focusing on the past few years and we continue to do is just laying the foundation, right? We're, we're laying the groundwork for, for this sport sport, this League of Legends esports to, to be generational. We, you know, creating the LCS and, and switching from a sporadic, unpredictable tournament format to a more consistent, inclusive, high quality experience that we, uh, you know, try to put on week in, week out. And we, we don't always, let's, let's be clear, you know, we're not done. We don't always, we don't always nail it and we're learning year over year. But by creating this league that, that you have like stars and, and, and pro teams that people feel attached to, it's essentially created this foundation that we could potentially, you know, like get, you know, sponsors or broadcast partners and, and, uh, and get others involved to, to create a really healthy ecosystem that sustains itself, right? Right, right now, um, you know, Riot really funds a lot of uh, esports because it's, a, it's, some, it's an experience that players love. And and that's important, but but we actually believe that you know as a sport with all these fans with with all this passion and energy around it, uh, this this can and should be something that's sustainable, and uh, and it'd be good for everyone, right? We want it to be sustainable because we want pros who now you know this is the living for them. We we want them to be able to 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 bank on that year in and year out. Uh, you know we used to get asked by some of the pro players like, hey, are you doing LCS again next year? What's cool is that we've gotten beyond that, right? This sort of I think at this point every Everyone just assumes, yes, every year there's going to be an, a League of Legends Pro League and it's going to be awesome and we're going to try to level it up every year. Um, but how do we sort of take that to the next level? It's an interesting, like, going from the the uncertainty of that to the, oh, this is business as usual. Like this, And you made that point earlier of, like, you know, the actual running of LCS as a business because – while it is an it's an awesome player experience, it is also a business for us. So I think it's really interesting to kind of explore that idea. Um, so you've been with League since season one, is that right? 
No, no. Um, I think we both joined in 2012. I don't yep. know when you joined, it was, but it was 2012. coming up on the Galen Center. Uh, okay, World so season two. Season two. Yeah. Season two. Okay. Yeah. So we've actually had like, uh, you know, we've had uh, uh, Scar on the podcast before, and he's talked a little bit about the kind of old, the old, the good old days, right? And same with Freak. Like Turley was on here and talked a little bit about like the old days, and that was really interesting to listen to it from like from the player perspective and also from the shoutcaster perspective, but from like the operational perspective, like actually running the show and everything, like what are some of those those things that you remember like of lessons learned and, and just crazy experiences back in the day? Were you half on fire or fully on fire? Fully on fire. It was <laughs> fully on fire, yeah. I was, was I was at LA Live that year. I'm I I still hear the screaming sometimes. <laughs> right. I, I that still wake up us. in a cold sweat. Yeah, sometimes. that was us <laughs> screaming. Actually, it's like oh, the internet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, t- to be perfectly honest, like we we were so passionate about the idea, and we were so bought in as League of Legends players, as as aspiring esports fans, right? Um, but there was a lot to learn, right? It was no one goes to school for esports, right? Sure. And so yeah. we had to we we strove to build a team of diverse backgrounds and competencies, right? But there was so much learning to do. Um, we didn't want to uh, temper our ambition, though, right? We wanted to create these awesome experiences, and, and a lot of that is learning how to put out fires while being on fire, while running <laughs> through a fire. So. I mean, I think something that we've learned pretty consistently is that uh, uh, we, we, as long as we keep ourselves in a learning mindset, we'll be okay. As long as sure. we, we, we constantly um, make sure that we're not you know, we're not settling for what we've got. Um, first and foremost, because I think players, rightly so, sort of ex- always expect the best, and and that's awesome, right? And so, um, you know, players, or in this case, esports fans, keep keep us honest because they always want more and more and more, and and we strive to to do that. Um, and the the other thing is that we just have to be humble in our in our mistakes because, uh, you know, when we're we're creating something new that at least in the West not a, you know hadn't really been done before at the scale and the and the the, the quality and the scope that we wanted it to do it at. Um, you know, we, we had to, to sort of be humble in that, you know, we were going to, to try our best and we're going to, and we put something out there in, in season three was the, the first time we did the LCS and, and we're, we're super proud of it, even in hindsight. I mean, hindsight, we look back and we're like, oh my God, like, what did we do? This was kind of shitty. Uh, uh, I don't know if I can say shit on the podcast. It's, but fine, it's fine. <laughs> right, Awesome. But, um, but, but we were proud at the time because we, sure. kn- we know that it's an incremental process. We, we, we knew that we, um, just had to, uh, you know, constantly strive to improve. And I think that that's been the hallmark of our team here is that we we never settle and we're always going to ask ourselves, how can we do it better next year? There's a really fun difference uh, between your guys' team and and pretty much everybody else at Riot. I'm sure I'm missing some teams that operate similarly. Uh, Less crucial. handsome. <laughs> <laughs> or more handsome. I mean, Shanti's pretty good looking guy. Of course, guys, come on. Uh, the crucial difference is that for you guys... The dates don't slip. The event has to go off. The season has to start, things like that. So much of what we do, you know, like obviously we're, we're going as hard as we can to make sure that we hit that target date. But if if something breaks, like it, it's fine. It will, we, you know, we, we, we can readjust in that way. And you guys have never had that luxury or very rarely do. And yeah, early on, things were crazy. And and it still are, obviously. But it has been, I, I feel like it has been a really cool and long-term advantage for you guys, actually, in that it's just a crucible. You know, you guys you guys have to hit those marks. And, and what better way to get uh, to get better over time? Yeah, I mean, it's, um, you know, when, when you're making these decisions, right, of should we delay because we want to hit a certain quality threshold, we don't always have that luxury, yeah. as you said. So, <laughs> I mean, we've gotten very good at, you know, learning how to scope and 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 if necessary, get really good. They they call, you know a lot of people might have might know calling the MVP or the the minimum viable product. Right. We've constantly challenged <laughs> the bar of what MVP is, <laughs> and and then and then in in so doing, we've also uh, really forced ourselves to get better at uh, starting earlier and 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 getting sort of more efficient and and uh, and, and valuing that as a team and. Um, but but I do think that the, the the luxury of not being able to slip sort of forces us to to 
we always have to put ourselves out there. And what yeah. we do is extre extremely visible. We are, you know, we constantly are on Reddit or on Twitter. Like yep. we, we know, <laughs> like when we get feedback and, and we, we read that feedback and um, that's, that's created a really positive culture though of, of us being cool with, uh, it's not, we're not cool with failure, but we know that we, we, we know that we have to do our best. And then if we, wherever we do slip up, we're going to then take that as a learning to improve the next time. Well, I mean, and, and I've said this, I think, on the podcast before, you know, failure isn't necessarily a bad thing. Like, you learn the most from failing, right? Yeah. And like We've learned said, a lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, like you said, like, it's important to fail so that you can learn, and they, then you just don't repeat the failure exactly. the, the next time. So, uh, Shanti, you know, you were talking, um, uh, Waylon was talking a little bit about, like, you know, we've learned to, like, start planning earlier, doing things like that, like, you know, you are uh, you're a person who's been behind uh, several uh, LCS like major events at this point. Like, how long do these events take to like put together? You know, soup to nuts. Uh, <laughs> it's, I could give you an answer, but we keep pushing that bar back and back and back <laughs> and back because it turns out there's no amount of time that is sufficient to start planning events. Um, what I would say though is like especially early on we. We knew we wanted to host events. We knew we wanted to go bigger and better year over year with the World Championship, right? Um, and in a lot of ways, we were going into places that didn't understand the sort of player experience we wanted, right? They didn't understand what a video game championship would look like. Um, and so a lot of the times we have to kind of fly by our seat of our pants in a, in a really tight window to try to get stuff out the door and you know, get the stage built. Um, I think the important part so much isn't like the – how much time is needed it's it's how much of that backstage panic actually gets in front of the cameras right like and we use the term fire a lot when we're talking about esports and we're talking about esports events i'm i'm actually fine with there being fires as long as if you're watching if i'm watching i don't see that fire ever um i think that's been if if nothing else that's been kind of a a, a grade that we try to keep uh for ourselves perpetually yeah. i mean fun fact on the on like the time, right? Like we planned Galen Center season two with like m in maybe a month, maybe like six wow. weeks, right? <laughs> yeah, and that was stupid, right? Like <laughs> that might have been a case we should have pushed back, but but at the same point, you know, by by sort of drawing that line in the sand and saying, you know, we're going to do this um, after you know many multiple hundred plus hour weeks later, we're able to to do something that we're pretty proud of given given the, the time constraints. And sure, LA Live was a complete shit show and, and in terms of uh, that internet. But again, we also took that learning and we got the locally hosted tournament realms out of it. So I think that like ultimately... Um, it you know it really added a lot of value to the esports scene, yeah. um, and and now we're rolling that out to to not just North America, but you know it's in Europe, and we're we're extending it to to other events globally. So um, these days we start planning a whole lot earlier. I mean, um, you know, Shanti's doing All Star this year, and and uh, they're they're sort of kicking it off, even though it's a December event, they're kicking off the planning for it already. So um, you know, wow. it, it's it's a far cry from six weeks. Uh, now we have, uh, whether it's a year plus, uh, we're, we're looking at like six to 12 months out, we, we begin planning. That's a, that's a whole lot of moving pieces to put together, yeah. though. So. so one thing I'm curious about on those, along those lines is, is that, you know, obviously we, we talked a bit about the early stage where it was, you know, and, and for years it was pretty much, we'll do it bigger, we'll do it better, <laughs> and, and, and we need more people, and just like all of that. And, and I, I, I got to imagine now, like obviously on the public side, and, and I imagine to some extent uh, uh, internally as well, you guys are kind of moving, you're, you're looking towards the more stable future. You know, we did the World Cup Stadium uh, for the last, you know, World Finals. It doesn't really get much bigger than that. I suppose you guys could, you know, renovate the Coliseum in Rome or something mm. like that and do yeah, it. Yeah, that but, was but, on the docket. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Riot Moon Base is yeah. also something that circles around uh, every so often. Yeah. We often get a uh, Cowboy Stadium. That's that's a oh, common oh, one that players oh, ask oh, for. Jerry's yeah. House. Yeah, yeah Jerry's oh, man. House. I, that Jerry would Bill. be amazing. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 and we're you know, please. <laughs> well, he's got the, the giant. He's got like, the Jumbotron. The Jumbotron's sure. already. So. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So that's, bigger bigger yeah. doesn't necessarily mean better. Absolutely. Right? Um, yeah. So how do, you, how do you guys do that? Like what what's what's your mindset right now in terms of like the more sustainable future you mentioned? 
I mean, like I said, bigger doesn't necessarily mean better um, in terms of, you know, how many people can sit inside a stadium. Um, when you think about the number of people who can, the number of players who can get to a stadium, sit down in a seat compared to the number of players who can tune in and yeah. watch in the, yeah. you know, from their own computer monitors, it's it's not even it's not even comparable, right? And it never will be. And it never will yeah. be. Um, and I think we we're conscious of that, right? And we had to kind of, in a way take a step back from the like the hunger for bigger stadiums <laughs> over and over again right um, you know korea was was a was an awesome moment and i think the players who managed to get there had an awesome moment and a lot of that translated to the stream right you could feel that energy you could feel the that crowd roar um, but ultimately we can use a lot of those resources and make a better stream experience, right? Make a better show. Um, and that's going to affect a lot more players and in really positive ways. Yeah, it, it's we just have to, and, and every event we sort of take this, take some stuff away from it, we have to understand like what is driving an impact, what makes an impact, um, you know, what, what and, and more specifically, what can impact everyone, right? When we're, when we're trying to play an event, um, you know, part of the reason why we, we like to do, you know, spectacle and, and, and grand cool stuff like the Imagine Fucking Dragons, right? Like, oh, <laughs> right. like awesome. They're they amazing, <laughs> right? Uh, but, but, but that was able to be enjoyed by, by everyone around the world. So we, we constantly asked ourselves, what are the things that we can do that everyone can enjoy? And so, um, and, and what is, you know, what is the optimal live experience so that, like, it can create the energy that translates to, to the, the stream at home because a lot of the people who were, you know, in Seoul in 2014, um, while there there was a ton of energy if you're you're there and you're in the, the, the sea of people, um, you know, watching it on stream, like I actually don't think it necessarily translated super well and maybe that's partly us of having to, to figure out how to capture someone in an outdoor stadium. But uh, there were a ton of complications around doing something at that scale that probably didn't need to happen. No probably elevators. Should have... I remember that. There are no elevators yeah. backstage, so everything had to oh, run wow. up and down stairs. We, yeah. we walked a We climbed a lot of stairs, <laughs> Shanti and I, that year. If yeah. only we'd had Fitbits yeah. then. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, it's, it's about understanding impact and trying to sort of balance uh, like the, the resources, right? It's not just money. It's money, time, focus, energy, trying to maximize and min-max. It's like being a gamer. We're just trying to min-max. <laughs> right. We're trying to min-max all those things to, um, to deliver sort of player value and player value being not just you know awesome experience for the the people there but but the awesome experience for the people at home so um it the the challenge is coming up with new ways to in fact uh, to to impact that equation new new inputs uh, like you know hey what if the screen were like all led right that's sort of the question we asked ourselves in berlin and and what can we do with that and how can we then maybe take that uh, the next time and, and, and do it even better. So um, that's the challenge of staying creative and, and coming up with new ideas and new ways to impact people. Very cool. All right, so I want to shift gears a little bit. Um, th th by the way, super interesting, like, insight into how we run events. Like, uh, I don't think a lot Waylon of people... Waylon and Chanti carrying boxes up and down stairs. <laughs> <laughs> Your calves must be huge! <laughs> um, but I do want to shift gears a little bit because there's an interesting point of conversation that comes up a lot uh, if you read in the subreddit and even, like, some, uh, amongst some, like, esports journalists and whatnot. And they talk about kind of this, this kind of interesting dichotomy between Riot Games as the the developer of League of Legends and Riot Games as the operator of LCS and th I think there's a lot of back and forth I mean it seems like there's a lot of like well you know it's 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 not okay for Riot to be doing both at the same time because there's conflicting interests but at the same time it's like we're doing this for a very specific reason yeah it's a great question yeah I mean Look, it, and everyone's gonna have an opinion, and, and and I mean, this is this is the subreddit we're talking, and this is the law subreddit. Like, you're never gonna come to consensus unless it's like, hey, everyone, grab your pitchforks, and everyone's like, yes, look, we 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 can agree on grabbing pitchforks. Uh, but uh, I I think the 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 key here is, um, we we whether or not we should be running like a league in the scene, right? Well, should we be running LCS? Should someone else be running LCS? Like ultimately at the end of the day, we don't run every league in every region, right? And our aspirations aren't to run every league in every region. I mean, what we're trying to, to min-max here is like how awesome of a league can be delivered to players and can the League of Legends Esports League be awesome? And who's capable of doing so and what, who are the best partners? And in regions where we just didn't feel like, whether it's at the time or whether it's now, it didn't feel like there's there were the partners that could deliver the experience we wanted to deliver, 
to, at the quality bar we needed to be delivered, then we felt like, okay, maybe maybe this is something that we have to take upon ourselves. Um, and it's hard. And again, like we're not perfect, but we feel like we've, you know, in, in certain areas done a, a pretty damn good job. Um, but, you know, in, in other regions where we have great partners, right, and in Korea, like o, OGN, obviously, like they're, they they do yeah, a man. great job with the production, dude. I, I stay up real late and lose a lot of sleep watching watching that stream. Um, but, um, and they're not the only ones. In, in, in China, we work with Tencent to do things and multiple production partners to, to work on the LPL and same thing in, in a lot of the Korean regions. So it, it's all about making sure, we, we do feel a responsibility at the core level of making sure that the scene is as good as it can be. Uh, and then that means that if we're working with a partner who's sort of not up to snuff or isn't performing, we have it's our responsibility to to either work with them to get better or find a new partner or take it in-house. Um, and, and at the end of the day, all that matters is is how how healthy is the scene? How good is the scene? How good is the experience? Yeah, so it's interesting. Uh, you you kind of made me realize something new here, which is that, uh, yeah, we do the LCS, but in fact, the the vast majority of I guess people watching League of Legends pro leagues are actually watching ones that aren't directly run by us, probably. Yeah. Yeah, there, you know, there are thirteen pro leagues around the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> um, <laughs> I didn't even know that that number was that high. Yeah, yeah. That, there's a lot, man. Uh, it's it's all of the the relatively newer, smaller regions. I imagine there's mm-hmm. Brazil League, a Turkish yeah. League, and I, I don't even yeah. keep what well enough, but they got to have a lot of players there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Korea, China. There. Oh yeah, of course. South, uh, oh. GPL, oh, going Taiwan, Oceania, LJL, two Latin Americas, Brazil, uh, NA, EU, Turkey, and Russia. Shanti, good. I'm, I'm going to okay. hold up my hands. <laughs> hold up my hands. There, there are right. a lot of them, and 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 and, and, and we don't run all of them. Sure, right. and and the interesting thing there is, I got to imagine it's actually because you guys are the ones who interact with them and, and kind of like, you know, help them level up where they need it or just kind of manage their relationship, it's actually got to be incredibly invaluable that we have our hand in the game, so to speak, and, and we can kind of understand where they're coming from and, and, and we're going through that same experience as they are. Yeah, the, the back and forth between regions has been awesome, right? Like the way we view it is there's like a, a, a global collective bar that across various crafts and disciplines and, 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 and whatnot, and each region like has a strength and if we can um you know like t- as a central team that like that, that sort of coordinates between all the regions like aggregate all that knowledge we're each going to be able to take some something and learn from it right like we've learned from uh OGN and the Korean leagues and and uh, you know, despite what the OG and fanboys might say, they've learned from us, right? <laughs> and, and and they've learned from us, and they've improved, and and we push ourselves to get better. And ditto China, ditto Taiwan, and uh, and, and that's what's awesome about it is that when you have thirteen regions all working to make theirs as good as possible, you're going to have opportunities to learn from each other. And so we actually have like a global esports summit where you know the the heads and the teams from each region come and we we learn and we teach each other all these things but we're we're constantly yeah, iterating so much and challenging ourselves and not only from the leagues who are you know b- being run there but from the players in those regions right the oh sure you know i remember watching the turkish finals when when you know the 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 fans that showed up to sing the Bashiktas songs oh, and wave the flags, yeah. and, <laughs> that, was and cool. that was that was a moment that sent that sent chills down my spine, right? And it's I think it's we are perpetually humbled by the players in those regions, how much passion and energy and excitement they bring, and it it helps to show us kind of the the glimpses of the next steps about what esports could be as a global sport. Sure. So let's even go wider. Uh, I, I you know honestly, I'm just guilty pleasure asking you guys these questions out of things <laughs> I want to know. Um, we, you know, we have a lot that's exciting within the sphere of of League of Legends esports that we talked about, but esports as a whole is just there's new awesome stuff all the time, like yeah. great news left and right. It's and, exciting. And, yeah, and I'm wondering how how do how do you guys? I mean, you're probably the, uh, some of the best people to to talk about how how we kind of see ourselves within that 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 burgeoning market that's going on out there. Yeah, I mean that's that's a really interesting question. I I think the at the end of the day, we all sort of impact each other, right? Um, you know, first and foremost, because, uh, you know, all all the different esports usually have similar clubs and organizations, right? Like I was just sure. watching the, the, the CSGO major and I was seeing, um, you know, Team Liquid, right? Yeah. Huge upset versus Fnatic. Um, <laughs> versus Fnatic, right? So, yeah. so like these are these are organizations that that also play League it's of really Legends. It's really weird so. when they're amazing in one thing and terrible. Yeah, in it's just, <laughs> and it's just weird. Yeah, um, but but either way, like you know, if if we do well, we know that we sort of uh, you know create a groundswell 
behind the concept of esports and you get more interest and you get, you know, entities covering it and and that positively affects other esports and vice versa. When, you know, CSGO is successful and, and garners the attention, we know that we benefit as well. So we sort of view ourselves as as sort of, uh, you know, in, in, occupants in the same in the same home, and so uh, you know we're we're doing our thing, and we're not really competing, right? Where it's not like oh man, like so like this esports is doing this, we've got to do it, but we can learn from them and maybe take some things that that might work for our ecosystem and learn from them and again, vice versa. Ultimately, to we're gamers who love this space, you yeah. know. So like yeah. we were watching <laughs> CS:GO and yelling and pointing and talking and discussing, right? And every time. Uh, an awesome new esports event goes off well, you know, we get to enjoy it as viewers as yeah. well. Right? Yeah. So nice change nice. from the boxes yeah. up and down the stairs. <laughs> <laughs> it is nice to attend an event where I don't need to feel responsible for it. <laughs> so it's interesting you're talking about like the crossover between like the brands, like the, the Team Liquid, uh, the, the Fnatic, and stuff like that across different. Um, different sports within esports, right? Is that? Do you think that's going to continue to be the trend, like as esports evolves and gets gets older? Is it continue going to be like kind of brand driven as opposed to like more tra traditional sports, like with soccer or I'm sorry, football in Europe and you know or or American football where it's like regionally driven, right? Yeah, I mean, I I think that you know who knows what the future will hold. I think that um, you know maybe one bold prediction is that you know there are a lot of games right now saying like we're an esport, we're an esport, we're an esport. I I think that that very few games are really true esports, and that like the mastery curve is near infinite, and you can see clearly skill being distinguished, and there's moments of tension, and it's a really great spectator experience. So, um, I I don't think we're going to have like 50 esports in the future, as some games understand that like you know you just as a viewing experience maybe it's like a streaming game instead of like a hardcore like pro league esports level thing um but but i do think that there is always going to be uh, more connectivity between the various esports than there is between say like the nba and the nfl because of these organizations and i don't necessarily at least in the near future see necessarily that going away is it it's, it's really that that point you make though about like all these different games coming up saying that, that we're in eSport too right now. Like, how how much can, like, eSports, like, as a concept or as, like, an abstract idea, like, how much can, can that support? Like, how many different games can that support and actually have a competitive scene that, that truly grows and, and, and burgeons over time? Like, if you look at football, American football, football is football, right? You know, basketball is basketball. eSports has this weird problem where it's like there's not one thing that is defined as that so like how 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 can we grow with that we well, were hoping you would answer that for us actually yes <laughs> you're right yeah on. i wish you could tell <laughs> me. uh no but i mean i mean i think that there there's certain games that you'll you'll have are just great you know sort of straight like i said like great streaming games great spectator mm -hmm. games and i think that you know we'll get better at understanding why that is over time um, and, and, and what I like to say is that we're just so super early in the, in, yeah. in, in, you know, even though I know esports in Korea, especially has been around for a long time, we're, we're still super early in understanding like what makes a game a great esport, like what, you know, makes it worth having a league that you can watch for a generation, or is this something that, um, you know, that the scene is small, but incredibly passionate, right? Like something like Evo is awesome yeah. right um and you know do you need to necessarily force a pro league model onto that i i don't think so i think that the beauty of evo is that it is this one-time thing that everyone that sort of you 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 can sort of appreciate it at one moment um so i, I would i would even yeah. disagree that it is a problem um one of the great things about gamers is they tend to be uh, incredibly selective in what they spend their time uh, on, right? And if I can spend an hour playing a game or an hour watching a game, that viewing experience better be pretty good to get me to, you know, sit and watch instead of experiencing it myself. So what we'll probably end up seeing is is a lot of, you know, there will be Evos, right? And those will be awesome and passionate fan bases there. Um, but it's going to we're, we're going to see the natural selection of this like new form of entertainment kind of play itself out. I think it's playing itself out now. And I think that League of Legends is an example of, of uh, you know, a strong contender in the field. Yeah, Waylon, you said something that was super interesting to me, which is that uh, I, I guess what I'm imagining in my head is that if I'm watching uh, somebody who's completely terrible at soccer do soccer and then, and then Lionel Messi do soccer, 
Hmm. I, I as a completely like a complete layman could tell that there's some there's the very significant yeah. skill and mastery going on there. Uh, and, and that's really easy to see. League of Legends, I'm not sure if I could say that, at least not to the same extent, if I were a complete layperson. Right, and, and and I think that's a key note, right? I think someone who plays League and understands League can, in fact, appreciate the skill. And I think that's what, one of the reasons why League of Legends is such a great sort of esport in mm -hmm. that um, you know, there's very little up to chance, you know, cr you know, wild turtle crit activated, you know, notwithstanding. But... Uh, but but I but I think that you know the the RNG elements are, mm -hmm. are are not really there. There's a lot of skill shots. Like you can tell Faker being Faker, Absolutely. right? Like, um, and now that might prohibit us from going fully mainstream, which I think is fine. Sure, uh, absolutely. But but I think that over time, what's great about esports is I always like to say it's like time's on our side and we're on the right side of history yeah. because, <laughs> uh, you know, video games aren't going away. And, mm -hmm. and the more people that grow up with the, you know, playing games and are comfortable with games and, and comfortable watching games, I think that that's going to fuel like an even larger group of of, of potential esports fans that will enjoy watching games as their primary form of recreation. Right. If my children are any like any like indicator of it, you are a hundred percent spot on. Like my kids would much rather watch YouTube videos of their favorite Minecraft, you know, player like Minecraft YouTube content creator. Like they they watch that over TV. Yeah, they watch that over anything on Netflix and stuff like that because like. They that is their form of entertainment. That is what they're native to as kids these days. And they're like they're only nine years old, but like you can tell they're already just grokking that so hard that it's gonna translate to when they get older, right? And right now they have zero interest in League of Legends. Um, but I'm guessing though, like in four or five years, just wait, just wait. <laughs> they're gonna be like, you know, suddenly I get to be cool dad at that yeah. point. So. Future LCS pros, right here. That's right. I think so, the the aspect of growing up with it, I think, is an outstanding point. And yeah. uh, yes. soccer is is it's a it's the beautiful game for a reason. Like, there's such <laughs> pure simplicity there. But uh, as as someone who who loves rugby, the first time you watch rugby, you oh, see a, a pile of, of sweaty men or women fall on top of each other and then a ball squirts out, you know, and you have no <laughs> idea what's going on, right? And yet rugby is the, the second most popular sport in the world. Um, is it? It is. Yeah. It is. Um, and Wow. I don't remember that. The, there's a lot of people out there outside the U.S. <laughs> okay. Yeah, fair. Honestly, part of that is people grow up surrounded by rugby culture, right? They, yeah. they, they grew up surrounded by this amazing sport, and so that barrier to entry is kind of naturally weaned out as they're growing up, right? And I think for the first time we're seeing, I mean, us four sitting here, we grew up with video games. And so the but barrier to entry- from when we were two. That's the interesting <laughs> Just wait. I, yeah. I, I think that our, like, sort of our quote unquote gender, like, we're old. We're like, we're yeah. well, yeah. we're well above. We remember the wow, 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 yeah, yeah. when yeah. logging on and stuff exactly. like that. Yeah. So yeah. like, it'll be trail. interesting, <laughs> like the purely digital, like you know, the, the the generation that grows up purely digital will be will be really cool to see how they behave, how they view esports, how they view traditional sports. I think that I think yeah. a lot of traditional sports are, are actually really worried about that. Sure, um, because games are super yeah. fun. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, and yeah. it's funny. I mean, the 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 early period is the thing that all leagues go through. I remember yeah. reading about the NBA in the '60s, back in the ABA and yeah. everything, and it was struggling like crazy. I'm pretty yeah. sure Major League Soccer lost money from like. 15 they still years. Lose money. Do they, they still, still lose okay? Money. They yeah. still lose money. Yeah. Um. And and they're still going. It can take so long to build it up and become you know the NFL, yep. Major League Baseball, that type of thing. But esports is crazy because again, it's going so dang fast. You know, yeah. in mm -hmm. year four or whatever of our of our main <laughs> esports efforts, we're in a World Cup stadium. You know, so <laughs> yeah, yeah. Future's gonna be crazy, man. So speaking of the future of the LCS, like what what does the future hold for for LCS and EU LCS? Well, I mean, you know, there's this little format change coming up in in summer that I know a lot of people are sad for. We're we're th I'm very pumped. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that the the summer experience will be fairly different. Um, you know, best of like, format changes we take incredibly seriously, and we're we're probably you know overly deliberate about making sure that we switch once we're pretty sure that there's going to be a ton of value in it because you know going back is tough and the switching costs are high. So um, a lot of our team is really focused on, of course, delivering an awesome spring final in Vegas and and and, and crushing MSI in in Shanghai. And you know, I, we we we've learned from previous experiences that that doing an esports event in China is hard, but we we, we aim to do our best. Uh, but the the for LCS in particular, the the format change is going to be a big deal. Going to dual streams, right. playing best of formats, like it, it'll be interesting to see. You know the 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 leagues grown year over year. Like and and I we we think that there are sort of 
uh, more people who are fans now of teams than just sort of like broad LCS fans. But we'll we'll see whether that'll be the case or not. So, um, but either way, just because we've watched enough esports now, we do like the the story and the drama of the best of series. So we think that it'll actually be a really fun viewing experience coming up. It's going to be a lot harder. So wow. we've yeah. said, <laughs> you know we're, we're, you know we're not doing this to, to make it easy on ourselves. I, I was going to ask what what is the thing you're most worried about? Is it just the di- the difficulty of it? Is the, is there anything you're worried about on the on the player experience side? I mean, yeah, I mean, look, guys, like running the LCS is tough. It's not it's not easy, but but that doesn't matter. Like we we've, we've I think we've gotten good at it enough that now we're essentially running two LCS at the same time, right? <laughs> yeah. So so now, no, now there now there's four teams <laughs> playing on two stages and uh, two streams going on, and I think the analyst has to be awesome because now you're like jumping in and out between games. It's and our own little red around. zone. Yeah, it's like it's <laughs> the beginning of the the LCS red zone. Um, but uh, I, I think. In, in that way, um, we have to figure out how, like how do we how do we present it in the best way possible? Like we sort of had this one formula that we've been evolving over time and and just by introducing the split of saying, okay guys, now two games are going on at the same time, right? And and how do we do both streams justice? Um, wow, you know, yeah. there there are going to be some challenges there. Do you do highlights from the other game when there's some awesome play right we, in the middle? We don't know, but don't sounds know. like a good idea. Hey, keep coming. Keep, 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 keep coming. Keep, keep do you feel like we're on esports this summer? We've, we've yeah. Awesome. Are you busy after I, this? I, I can uh, carry boxes. I'll start, yeah, I'll start climbing go. stairs right now to get ready. There you I'm, go. I'm sorry, if, guys. Uh, Dylan's very, very busy right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, do we worry at, at all about kind of viewer fatigue with the uh, with this this new setup? Is it is that a concern, or do you think that players are just voraciously devouring the content already. I mean, we always view, worry about viewer fatigue, and mm-hmm. um, I mean, gi- especially given that we know there's so much crossover viewership too between North America or Europe, and just sort of like the 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 the, the two fan bases. You know, they love and hate each other, right? I mean, sometimes more hate than love. But but you watch both both sides. And so we want to be able to do this format challenge, which will be we believe is good for the league and good for the viewing experience, while simultaneously still enabling people to to view both at the same time. That's that's challenging. So um that's one of the reasons why we're doing the dual stream is so that uh, even though we are uh, producing I think a hundred and fifty percent more games uh, than wow. than before. That's a lot of games. It's a lot of games. <laughs> a lot of guys. It's a lot of games. Uh, but because you're going to have a dual stream on Saturday and Sunday, you'll um, sort of be able to say, "Hey, now let's say you're a fan of Cloud Nine and TSM. Uh, you, you're you're now going to be able. You know, before maybe you had four hours to watch over the weekend, uh, and then you maybe watch some other stuff. Now you'll be able to watch a lot more, right? You'll right. be able to watch four best of threes, right? Or if they play each other, yeah. you know, three. So uh, I think you'll get more targeted viewership. And a holistic level to point back to what we were talking about before. If something doesn't work, what? We're not going to blindly charge forward on it, right? Like we are in a continual state of of reassessment, right? And figuring out like what is the, what is either the next best thing we can try, or what's the next best evolution of something that is currently working. Um, this constant state of, I would say, uh, reassessment. Yeah. All right. Very cool. So one last little uh, little bit of business. Uh, we do have a pretty pretty big event coming up. I'm going to be there. I'm excited about it. Uh, the Spring Split Finals yeah. in Las Vegas at the Mandalay Bay Hotel. Uh, it's it's what April uh, 16th and 17th. 17th. Yeah, that's right. Um, tickets are still available, by the way, if you haven't bought them. Where do they go to get those tickets? You can go to lollysports.com. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and tickets available for both days uh, at this point? Yeah, I think the Sunday is pretty close to selling out, though. So, close. Um, yeah. All right. So, yeah. if you want to get the Sunday tickets, you better get in there now. Yeah. Um, and I. One I, one thing I do actually want to point out about like our events that we've always done, we've always kept them. We've always been very price conscious of them, um, and and maybe this is a little chest thumpy, and I, I don't mean it to be, but I'm actually I'm continually impressed by the fact that we put these really top notch like world class events on, but we always keep the tickets affordable for for players. Um, is that is that always going to be priority for us? That I mean, always- that's we don't want to price out the fans we don't price out the super fans that uh, you can see that i mean a great example was madison square garden uh yeah. in in sort of uh last year 
um, when we when we sort of had the pricing and, and those for us felt expensive. Yeah. Madison Square Garden was like, you guys are idiots. Right? <laughs> you guys are leaving so much money on the table and all these giving some t- guy in a suit yeah. and aneurysm. <laughs> yeah. And they're like, you guys can make so much more more money and you can um you know, and the worry is that because these tickets are priced so low, the scalpers are gonna come and swoop them up and yeah. and then they're gonna be on the, the secondary market for like huge markups. But what was cool was that we saw that even though the demand was incredibly high and it sold out super fast, uh, it was one of for, for that weekend one of the lowest like uh, percentage of tickets that were available on the secondary market, and that was because the people who bought the tickets wanted to show up and and be right. a fan, and and that's that's our thesis is awesome. we believe that that uh, you know esports fans and League of Legends esports fans want to go and they want to bring their passion and energy. So at that point, why price them out? Um, and so for us, that was actually uh, a huge validation and. and you know, fans, um, you know, never cease to to amaze us and, and surprise us, and that that's awesome, though. But yes, we 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 try our best to uh, keep the 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 cost low. There, that's not always we're not always going to be able to do that in certain cases. But we right. we try to within the framework we can. We always try to keep it as low as possible. Very cool. All right. Well, thank you so much to both Sean. Okay, thank you guys. Thank you. And it was fun. By. Yeah, no, we, we enjoy doing these. Um, and we'll definitely have you guys back. Oh, for sure. <laughs> yeah. For sure. We'll uh, just dig up some old stories. Incoming lowest uh, rating uh, ever. <laughs> and like, uh, never mind. <laughs> yeah, both their mothers watch. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll get you back after after Shanghai and see if you're like, if you're still, <laughs> if we're still alive. broken <laughs> individuals. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming by. Uh, and all of you, thank you all of you who are listening at home right now or, uh, you know, on the subway or in your car on your drive to work. We wouldn't be doing this without you. Um, if you are listening and you download it on iTunes, please make sure that you su- subscribe and that you rate us. Uh, those ratings do matter. Uh, and give us reviews. Let us know how we're doing. Let us know how we can do it better. Um, if you are on uh, Stitcher or if you're on um, SoundCloud, also be sure, uh, review us, like us, share us. Just basically get the word out there about the podcast. And uh, until next time, we'll talk to you later. Take care, folks. Bye.